of that uh, wonderful and uh, extraordinary introduction, I'm bored enough to need some vibrations. Uh, I've been here at Beth Israel for almost 15 years, and, and one of the most um, positive opportunities here has been to work with the Department of Music Therapy. Uh, clearly, our goals and our objectives overlap tremendously, and the willingness of the department to, to have music therapists assigned to our uh, palliative care consultation team has given it a, a very high level of, of visibility and robustness. Um, the department was established almost 15 years ago as the first department of its kind in the country, and we have done a number of cutting edge things, and one of the things I think we've been very good at is to create an interdisciplinary model for palliative care and for pain medicine, and music therapy is core to that. So this is a, this is a unique place, and a place I think Joanne and I are both committed to because of the opportunity to do these kinds of collaborations. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, I was given a very big task this morning. I needed to tell you all about best practices in pain medicine. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's a huge task. So I'm going to... Uh, just start off by saying that it's a task that uh, is clearly uh, paralleled by the importance of the topic. Uh, for those of you who um, have the New England Journal across your desk, you may see an editorial in this week uh, by the two co-leads of the Institute of Medicine report back in July. I'll mention that in a, in a second. And they talk about the enormity of the chronic pain problem in the United States, and they basically call for a cultural transformation in the way pain is evaluated and managed in the U.S. as a result of the healthcare system's inability to do better by the huge number of patients aff afflicted with chronic pain. So this is a very big area. Best practices are a very big topic. And what I'll try to do this morning is just touch on what the scope of and the nature of the problem is. Then I'll talk about key elements in pain assessment. And then I had to narrow this down somewhere because, as you probably can appreciate, everything from opioid therapy to interventions like implants to music therapy is all part of the armamentarium used for acute and chronic pain. And I can't possibly address best practices in all of those areas, uh, particularly those about which I know almost nothing. So I chose to talk a little bit about analgesic pharmacotherapy. The goal is to try to get us all on the same page about what would constitute best practice. And that way, when you engage with a patient, particularly as a member of a team trying to provide a plan of care, an interdisciplinary plan of care for the patient with chronic pain, you'll have some sense of whether or not the patient is getting a full array of best practice strategies. This, I think, is very uh, key to all interdisciplinary specialist level treatment strategies, whether they're for pain, for palliative care, for geriatrics, for any of the, any of the disciplines that feel very strongly about the need for interdisciplinary assessment and management. It is a goal for each member of the team to have enough background about what other members of the team do in order to feel comfortable that what you're doing as part of a plan of care represents all of the elements of a best practice. And that's my goal today. So let me just talk a little bit about how big the problem of pain is. It's the most common reason that patients seek medical care in the United States. Acute pain is, of course, ubiquitous. Everybody uh, except a few very small number of patients who, who lack the congenital ability to perceive pain, with the exception of that very rare subpopulation, all of the, all of the, uh, all individuals experience acute pain associated with surgeries and trauma. Chronic cancer pain affects somewhere between 30 to 90 percent of patients, depending on the extent of disease, uh, where in the disease trajectory the patient is. And chronic pain of all types affects between 15 and 40 percent of the U.S. population. Even as an international issue, there have been surveys to show the enormity of this problem. The World Health Organization studied persistent pain in primary care uh, some years back and in, a, in a survey of 5,438 primary care patients from 15 sites in 14 countries. 22% had pain that was described as persistent because it lasted more than six months and involved a need for specific care or caused disability. And those patients with chronic pain in that WHO study from around the world were more likely to have anxiety or depressive symptoms than, uh, than other patients. In the United States, um, data from the CDC 
showed that no matter what age group you're in, whether you're in the 18 to 44 year old, the 45 to 64 year old, or the 65 year old, if you look at patients who have low back pain during the past six months, those are the dark bars, and you compare those, those patients with patients who don't have back pain, in the last six months, whether you're talking about the limitation of activity caused by chronic conditions, or you're talking about a self-perception of fair or poor health, or you're talking about the experience of serious psychological distress, patients with low back pain are more likely to be impaired than patients without pain. As I mentioned before, in a very important document, uh, that is now out in press in its full version and a volume, but it's also been on the web for months as, a, as an executive summary. This report is 2011. It's from the Institute of Medicine. It represented an enormous national effort to get a handle on what the scope of the problem is. And this report has, uh, has um, uh, um, concluded that there are about 116 million Americans with chronic pain. That's a really big number of patients with chronic pain. And the aggregate cost in terms of lost pro productivity or lost work days and health care utilization is greater than $500 billion per year, more than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined. This is really such a, a, a stunning figure to understand the, the scope of the chronic pain problem in the United States. It's important for you to grasp this number and to understand that this number represents the best science we have. Um, I was recently at a conference in which somebody was trying to uh, lecture about the dangers of opioid therapy. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And in order to make the point that opioid therapy is overused, this uh, professional colleague indicated that uh, the pain problem is overstated in the U.S. and that we, we as a people tend to complain too much and to seek treatment for every little thing. And that to me is a scientific non-starter. The data are the data. The evidence is that pain is a very, very immense public health problem with huge impact on individuals, families, and society. Those are the data. Don't argue about the existence of these data. People who want to say that this doesn't exist are really people that you probably should just put in a cage and lock the door. <laughs> These are the data. Now you can argue about how to manage this problem as an individual provider or as a system, as a society, but don't argue about the data with me. These are the data. The, the IOM is about the most credible federal uh, uh, agency or organization for looking at these kinds of issues. So we now know that chronic pain in the United States is an immense public health problem. And to address pain as a public health problem, we need to improve recognition and assessment of chronic pain, reduce the barriers to the more effective use of multiple therapeutic moda modalities, deliver better education and training in pain management for all professionals, and improve access to appropriate specialist care. And this is what the IOM uh, committee members call the cultural transformation in the way we think about pain. Now, one of the insights I want to give you, if I can, I recently only came to myself. And that is this, con this construct that in the U.S. healthcare system, it's reasonable to think in terms of access to care at a generalist and a specialist level. This is something that those of us who have been in the palliative care community for the past 15 years have all agreed upon. Palliative care in the United States is now viewed as either being promoted and pursued at a generalist level or promoted and pursued at a specialist level. And that has, that has driven a lot of extraordinary changes, such as the adoption of palliative medicine as a formal subspecialty of medicine, and now a certified subspecialty of nursing, social work, and soon chaplaincy. So that desire for professional recognition through a certification process evolved from the perspective that you can look at palliative care as being provided at a generalist level, a specialist level. Ironically enough, given the commonalities between pain medicine and palliative medicine, this has really not been a part of the pain literature to such an extent, but I would propose to you that it's a good way of thinking about it. Pain management can be divided into generalist level care, which is a best practice during the routine care of all patients with acute or chronic pain, 
or it can be uh, designated specialist level care, which is care provided by individuals with special competencies. Generalist level care can be provided by clinicians in any discipline who are offering either primary care or some kind of a specialist service of another type. And I would include in that, at least this is my perspective, that that's mu music therapist as well. Music therapists are specialists in music therapy, but they may be generalists in pain medicine. And maybe after this conference, you'll be specialist in both. Right? That's the goal. Best practices for a generalist is to provide multidimensional assessment to establish a working pain diagnosis along with an understanding of the consequences and comorbidities that have to be understood in order to develop a plan of care. And the treatment of its pain, its consequences and comorbidities is under the purview of the generalist, but without the special competencies that the specialists bring to the equation. In contrast, there are systems that support generalist care, whether they're in hospitals, or nursing homes or out there in the community setting. These systems include QI and PI and also educational programming. So these are the systems that those of you who have been functioning as specialists in music therapy but generalists in pain management may have been interacting with. But in becoming a specialist in pain management, you'll, you'll probably move to a different level of the, of the system level approaches that uh, may promote um, best practice. Specialist level pain uh, management can also be clinicians in any discipline, but these clinicians have high level competencies through education and training, and some specialists like physicians, for example, can get certification. Uh, depending on what certifying body you look at, the United States now has somewhere between 4,000 and 9,000 pain, physician pain specialists. That's for a population of 116 million with chronic pain. So if you do the math, each pain specialist has to take care of a few hundred thousand pain patients. It's not a problem, we just won't sleep. <laughs> right? The math is the math. Uh, in America now, we have some people who believe in math and some people who don't believe in math. <laughs> if you are one of those people who believe in math, you know that pain specialists, referral to pain specialists cannot be the solution to the problem of chronic pain, because there are only somewhere between 4,000 and 9,000 chronic pain specialists in the United States. Figure it out. Now, what, what do pain specialists do? There are certainly high-level high competencies in different areas. One of the things you need to understand, this is very, very important, is that there are many different flavors of pain specialists. Some pain specialists are mostly interventional. And they've actually, which means they do injections and nerve blocks and implants sometimes. Some interventional people don't do implants. Some do implants. Some pain specialists are totally non-interventional. That would be like me. I'm a dying breed, but I never liked anything sharp. I have someone cut my meat for me. I just don't like anything <laughs> sharp. So I'm a pain specialist. I know a lot about interventions, but you really don't want me coming at you with a needle. Not unless you have a hole in your sock you want me to darn. <laughs> because I'm, I don't have any skills whatsoever. If you refer a patient to me because you think that patient needs an injection, I have to refer that patient on. So don't refer the patient to me unless you want me to assess the patient. So these are the obligations of people who are not specialists. And for those of us who are specialists, you have to know who in the community is what kind of specialist. It puts a high burden on health professionals to know that if you're going to help patients go to the right place if they can get access to pain specialists. Huge disparity problem in the United States, right? Because pain specialists by and large are not treating people who are poor. And most pain specialists in the United States don't want to treat patients who don't need any intervention. So we have a big, big disparity problem. But it's your obligation to, to know in the community who does what so that you can help guide patients if it's, if it's possible. Pain specialists talk a lot about interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary care. Unfortunately, in the United States, the reimbursement system that's been set up for physicians has tended to work against interdisciplinary care during the past 25 years, but we still talk about it as a model that is appropriate for some patients with, with, pain, uh, with chronic pain. There are many arrangements for, for um, interdisciplinary care, 
but all these arrangements include specialists who can provide and coordinate care intended to address pain, its consequences, and comorbidities, and typically now in pain medicine, interdisciplinary care is mostly focused on patients who have pain associated with a high level of disability, a high level of disability. <coughs> So now let's talk about the nature of the problem. I hope I've convinced you, if you believe in numbers, that pain is a very, very big problem. It's a public health problem. It's not just a problem for patients. It's a problem for society at large. It's a problem of immense proportion. It's an extremely expensive problem. It's a problem that needs to be addressed by generalists and specialists in all disciplines, including yours and mine. So this is really a foundational, uh, found, uh, sort of a foundational concept. Now let's talk about the nature of, of pain. There are many distinctions and definitions that are important in trying to understand the assessment of pain. I'll just point out a couple of that are very important. One is the distinction between acute and chronic pain, and one is the distinction between chronic cancer pain and chronic non-cancer pain. Acute pain is usually defined as pain anticipated to continue for a brief period, no more than days to weeks. It's usually associated with trauma, including surgical trauma, but the definition in practice extends beyond that to, to fleeting pains, to acute on chronic pains, to formal pains that are called breakthrough pains. So just understand acute pain is any pain that's likely to have a time course that is time limited, relatively short, and is severe enough to uh, engender a response on the part of the patient. Chronic pain is more complicated than acute pain to define. You can define chronic pain just in terms of a temporal criterion. You can say that any pain that lasts more than three months is chronic or lasts more than six months is chronic. And in your reading about pain, you'll see a lot of that. But there are more sophisticated definitions. One of the definitions that was promoted by the physician father of chronic pain in the United States, John Bonica, said this was back in the uh, early 60s, was that pain should be considered chronic if it lasts more than three months, then it's chronic. But if it also recurs frequently for a period of months, meaning to say acute pain that disappears, but occurs, re recurs frequently. And then finally, pain that's caused by a lesion that is not expected to heal, like a metastatic deposit, would be considered chronic, even if it hasn't reached the three-month temporal uh, criterion yet. Why is it important to think about acute versus chronic pain? These are characteristics that you may know about. Acute pain has a recent onset and, and is anticipated to end. That expectation has very profound psychological implications when, when people are comfortable with the idea that this too well, will end. Coping and adaptation is often supported by that perception in contrast to not knowing if this will ever end. When will I be released from this? That psychological context is often more distressing. So chronic pain has an indeterminate duration. Acute pain uh, may have a biological function suggesting warning and encouraging rest and help seeking. Chronic pain has no biological value that we know about. This, is, of course, is an inference of human beings about something we can only guess at. But to date, no one has really figured out why a person has chronic pain, how that can have, help in the survival of the species or in the individual with the pain. We just have no idea. So it probably has no biological value, so it's a disease. It may be, chronic pain may or may not be associated with identifiable pathological processes. Uh, it may or may not. So rheumatoid arthritis is, fibromyalgia is not, migraine is not, pain related to multiple sclerosis is. Acute pain, in contrast, usually is associated with some identifiable uh, underlying pathology. This, the importance here is really to realize that chronic pain need not be associated with anything you can see or measure in order to believe it. That's an important concept for physicians, particularly younger physicians, to realize a person can be in terrible pain and have nothing that you can see on examination or on imaging or on laboratory studies that allows you to say, oh, now I understand this. And finally, acute pain often is associated with anxiety and with a socially acceptable loss of functioning, whereas chronic pain is not associated with anxiety usually, but it may be associated with depressed mood, vegetative signs, and functional decline, which is interpreted as disability. This, of course, are, is very, very um, 
uh, general. And the heterogeneity within these populations is just enormous. Many patients with acute pains will not experience anxiety or a sympathetic outflow like, like a rapid pulse or hypertension, but some do. And many patients with chronic pain will not be depressed. So these are just generalities, but they help, again, categorize people into the kinds of boxes that may help you assess them. Now, chronic pain, historically, and with much, much more focus, has been distinguished between these two broad categories of chronic cancer pain and chronic non-cancer pain. One of, the, one of the things I want you to go away with is the idea that these are, have limited use and they can actually be quite destructive. So when you hear people being described as having chronic cancer pain or chronic non-cancer pain, don't fall into the trap of thinking you know what that means. Because I don't know what that means. And if I don't know what that means, you definitely don't know what that means. <laughs> you know, and I think this is an important point. Chronic cancer pain usually implies chronic pain related to active disease, active disease, but the variation is very important in terms of clinical guidelines. Some people talk about chronic cancer pain are really implicitly talking about advanced illness, where disease is metastatic and incurable uh, with uh, chemotherapy and other modalities. Some patients talk about chronic uh, cancer pain as being related to active disease or its treatment or comorbidity in the setting of, of a long life expectancy. But nowadays, most pain specialists are moving away from that and saying if a patient has indolent disease or is in a disease-free survival mode, a disease-free remission, let's not think about that patient as having pain in the same context as someone with metastatic disease just because they both had cancer. Right? We like rather think in terms of the pain characteristics, consequences, comorbidities, the features that distinguish that individual person, allow assessment of that individual person as opposed to thinking in terms of these broad generalities that can lead one down the garden path. And this is even more important with the concept of chronic non-cancer pain. You may be seeing in the, in, the, in the media now more and more concern about certain modalities of treatment being given to patients with chronic non-cancer pain. Uh, for example, opioid therapy. And I got interviewed by a reporter at the Milwaukee Sentinel on Friday of last week in which he called in order to get my confirmation that opioids are egregiously misused in the country. And he didn't like what I was saying at all. And he kept on saying, but don't you agree that for chronic non-cancer pain, it was X, Y, Z. He had his story all written already. He just had a blank where he wanted a quote from me. And I said, well, listen, what do you mean by chronic non-cancer pain? Do you mean chronic pain associated with patients who have advanced CHF and COPD? I said, we published two papers from my department showing high prevalence of chronic pain associated with heart failure and lung disease. Or you are talking about pain associated with Parkinson's disease. Big literature about pain associated with advanced Parkinson's disease. Or you're talking about multiple sclerosis. Or you're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. I said, what kind of non-cancer pain are you talking about? To which his response was, well, you know, doctor, I haven't really seen that in the literature too much. And I told him that maybe he needed to read more. <laughs> because one has to worry about these terms that lump this incredi incredibly heterogeneous population of patients into one category, often with the purpose of making a point that may not apply to many in the category. You know what I'm saying? It's very important. So don't allow yourselves to fall into that trap. You know, I mean, literally, this was no joke with this individual. I know his story was written, and all he wanted was a quote from the, uh, the chair of a department of pain medicine. And he did not like that I wouldn't give him the quote. Actually, I gave many quotes, and I expect to find the one I didn't give him in the paper. <laughs> in any case, it's important to recognize that the term chronic non-cancer pain implies pain related to common types of musculoskeletal disorders like low back pain. It implies that, but even in the low back pain population, what a heterogeneous population is low back pain population. You're talking about the 80-year-old with degenerative spine disease who's had pain for the last three years, or you're talking about the work-injured 25-year-old who's on disability and has a comorbid depressive disorder and a substance use disorder. Are they the same patient? Well, if you're a reporter from the Milwaukee Sentinel, <laughs> they are. They're the same patient. 
So this is important to recognize that this term re may refer to a progressive incurable medical condition such as multiple sclerosis. Perhaps this is comparable to cancer pain with advanced illness. <laughs> it may be related to stable but incurable diseases such as arthritis or post hepatic neuralgia, or it may be a primary pain disorder without any identifiable pathology like fibromyalgia or chronic headache disorder. So what's the unifying construct here? There's an important <laughs> implication to what I've been saying. And the implication is that the best way to think about chronic pain is not by these artificial categories that could lead you down a path toward misrepresenting the experience of some subpopulations and, and, and in fact perhaps treating them inappropriately, but to understand that pain is best viewed as an illness, not as a disease and not as a symptom, but an illness. And chronic pain, and the reason that we can think about pain as illness is that it is commonly associated with a whole panoply of bad, potentially bad outcomes, like impaired physical functioning, impaired psychosocial and <laughs> role functioning, mood disturbance, fatigue and sleep disturbance, poor quality of life and high healthcare utilization. This is different than calling an entity a disease, in which case you're usually talking about pathophysiology, and it's certainly different than talking about it as a symptom, in which case you're implying that the only important thing is what it's representing at a physiologic level below, right? This is talking about pain, chronic pain itself, as, as somehow leading in some complex way to, a, to an array of negative outcomes which are themselves serious problems in need of redress, including all the ones that are listed here. And the degree to which pain has become an illness is in part unrelated to its cause. So you will encounter patients with advanced cancer who have chronic pain whose level of resiliency, coping, and adaptation is such that pain is not an illness in that individual. That individual has a lot to cope with, but pain is, pain is being handled. And you may encounter somebody who twisted an ankle five years ago and now has such a degree of functional impairment, mood disorder, and uh, impaired quality of life that that twisted ankle five years later has become the overwhelming source of the illness. And how do you, how do you judge what to do with those patients? You obviously take a step back, you assess each individual as an individual, and make a judgment about what it is that this individual brings to the clinical, clinical encounter that can help you develop a plan of care. So pain is illness. Um, in populations with chronic non-cancer pain, this illness behavior is often called disability. And in patients with advanced medical illness, this illness is often called suffering or total pain. And I just, again, trying to highlight to you how the language is evolving. If you talk to a palliative care guy and we talk about pain as illness, we often talk about suffering. If you're talking to a person who does rehabilitation for a living and they talk about the illness associated with chronic pain, they talk about disability. In a sense, we're talking about the same set of phenomena. Okay, and, and obviously the extent to which we, we pigeonhole patients Pigeonholing is not necessary, necessarily a bad thing. Some pigeons are good. Some pigeons carry histoplasmosis, not good. You know, if you pigeonhole a patient in order to use that information as a framework for a plan of care, that could be good. If you pigeonhole a patient, put the blinders on, and don't do an assessment and don't see the illness piece, for example, something doctors do a lot of, we don't see the illness piece, we see the symptom, we see the disease, we don't see the illness, then it's not good. So this is what I was trying to suggest to you. Pain is one factor that may lead to global disability or suffering. Other, other factors like physical and medical comorbidities or psychiatric psychosocial comorbidities may also contribute to disability or suffering. Pain it might, may lead to medical, physical, psychosocial consequences, which themselves lead to disability and suffering. And social support, coping, and adaptation may be factors that mediate or moderate the relationship between pain and disability with suffering. Having some understanding of these relationships is a good framework for developing an assessment strategy and a treatment strategy. So now we can talk about assessment. Pain diagnosis is a concept that's evolved over the past 25 years, and there's many different ways to think about pain diagnosis. The way I think about pain diagnosis 
is that I believe you need to characterize the pain first. In other words, ask the patient about his or her experience of the pain in terms of location, radiation, temporal qualities, um, the, the quality of the pain itself, uh, whether or not it's getting worse, getting better, what makes it worse, what makes it better, all those factors that help you characterize the pain, and then try to understand the pain in terms of its syndrome, its etiology, and its pathophysiology. And then that's part of the story. The other part of the story is to understand pain consequences and comorbidities. If you characterize the pain, understand it in terms of syndrome, etiology, and pathophysiology, and then understand its consequences and comorbidities, you have a picture. A picture of what that illness is for that individual person. And that picture then allows you to develop a plan of care. The syndrome and the etiology have been um, explored um, increasingly during the past two decades, but not, not uniformly. So we know a lot about syndromes in cancer. We know very little about syndromes related to, for example, HIV or multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease. We don't know much about syndromes there. But if you can identify the syndrome or if you can identify the etiology, the, the disease entity, the biomedical, the pathophysiology in the body that it seems to be driving the ongoing pain perception, it may help elucidate the nature and the severity of underlying diseases, and it therefore may help clarify what you can do about treating the patient's pain. For a physician, we would never discount the value of treating the underlying cause. We should just recognize, however, that you can treat the underlying cause and not necessarily help the patient. But we would always try to find the underlying cause. So if someone does have an arthropathy, severe pain that's coming from joint, if we can identify the etiology of the arthropathy and it's treatable, we would always think that that might have value as part of a plan of care. And this, of course, may require laboratory imaging tests or referral to other specialists. The pathophysiology of the pain has evolved as a concept also in the past quarter century. And this is an interesting uh, s uh, construct for me because the reality is that it's such a gross oversimplification that the more that science understands about pain mechanisms in the body, the less it's able to do this crosstalk between these broad categories. And yet, clinically, it's useful. So you'll hear your physician colleagues and, uh, and nursing colleagues talk about nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, psychogenic pain, and mixed syndromes all the time. Nociceptive pain is pain that is inferred to be related to ongoing tissue injury. The implication is if you can fix the injury, people feel better. There are examples to make us think that this actually happens in life. For example, someone with intense chronic pain related to degenerative arthritis of the hip, if you do a total hip replacement, the pain goes away. So that makes sense. Whatever's going on in the hip on an ongoing basis was driving the pain. That would be called nociceptive. Then neuropathic pain is pain that's inferred to be related to injury to the nervous system. Very complex array of syndromes. Polyneuropathy, like diabetic painful polyneuropathy. Mononeuropathy, like, like post-herpetic neuralgia or, or tumor invasion by, by uh, tumor invasion of a nerve. A whole variety of different etiologies that may drive painful neuropathy. But the bottom line is that these pains are believed to be linked by some set of pathophysiological mechanisms that live in the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system and sustain the pain. Psychogenic pain is a term that many people don't use anymore, but I think pain specialists tend to use it as sort of a shorthand. And that's pain that's inferred to be primarily related to somatoform disorder, primarily related to psychological factors. This is not pain that is not experienced. This is very important, right? So some people, people always, in fact, the reporter from the Milwaukee Sentinel said, don't you think people can lie? I said, I think you could lie. <laughs> I didn't say that. I thought that, though. But the reporter from the Milwaukee Sentinel said, don't you think people can lie? And I said, yes. So if you're implying that as a physician, every so often we encounter a patient who will not be telling the truth, yeah, that's true. 
but the vast majority of people, we think, it's difficult to tell because there's no such thing as a painometer. You can't stick <laughs> something in the person's brain and say, oh, I see your pain, right? So pain is only subjective, but we think, based on about nine millennia of experience, eight millennia of which I've had myself, we think that the vast majority of people who say I hurt are experiencing hurt. They experience pain. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's due to disease in the body. It can be due to disease of the psyche, or more likely both. There are people, of course, who don't tell the truth. And there are also people who, don't, who can't help not tell the truth. Right? If you can't help not tell the truth, then you have a factitious disorder, like Munchausen syndrome, or factitious pain disorder. Those are very difficult disorders to diagnose. The, percep the perception is the patients with those factitious disorders are not experiencing what they say they experience, but they can't help but say that. Very challenging to diagnose, right? Especially without the painometer. But the reality is that the vast majority of patients who believe to have psychological drivers of pain should be assumed to be experiencing what they tell you. For a health professional, that's a big deal, particularly for a younger health professional particularly one who's a trainee and you know that you can punish them if they get it wrong. You need to punish them very, very profoundly if they get this wrong. They should just believe the patient. Doesn't mean they have to prescribe anything, doesn't mean they have to cut a nerve, doesn't mean they have to come in in the middle of the night, all that noxious stuff. It just means you have to believe the patient. Because if you believe the patient, we think, meaning to say people who have been around a long time and have studied this a long time, we think you'll generally get it right almost always will get it right. Will you be burned occasionally by people who lie? Of course, that's the nature of being a clinician. Do you want to not believe the enormous majority out of concern that you'll be lied to by a tiny minority? That's a personal choice. If you want to make that choice, I would suggest another career, like banking. <laughs> If you want to be a health professional and you want to help these people, believe that they're experiencing what they say. Doesn't mean you need to do anything. That's the most important point here, especially for physicians. Physicians might get into an, a discussion with you as, the, as a member of the team and they say, you know, I don't know about this guy. You know, I don't know if the pain is real. I don't know if you've heard that. I don't know if the pain is real. So what do you say when the, when the young physician says, I don't know if the pain is real? So the first thing you say is, what do you mean by that? That's what I say. And I could punish them without saying that, but I'm going to say that. What do you mean by that? And then if they say, I don't think he's really feeling it, then you could say, well, look, we could act like that, but that's sort of a no-win game here. Why don't, we th why don't we think that the patient is experiencing what they're saying and try to develop a plan of care that makes sense? that balances safety and the potential for effectiveness and improvement in the patient just by believing what they say, even if they're annoying. Yes? Is there a variable called an individualized pain threshold for the very same condition where some people can tolerate much more? I had a parent Yeah, let me, let me answer the question. The question was, are there patients who have identical pathology identifiable in the clinic or by imaging who have different levels of pain? Or do they have the same disease and they have different levels of pain? So this pain is a... Pain threshold, the ability to, to cope with pain. I had a pain threshold is not... I had a, a parent who, who chose not to have any kind of uh, uh, needles for, 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 for a, a dentistry. It was more uncomfortable to have uh, the discomfort of a numb mouth. So let me, let, me, let me explain a couple of concepts quickly. So first of all, pain coping is not the same as pain threshold. Pain threshold, pain threshold. pain threshold is how much pain you'd experience with a specific stimulus. And the answer is uh, there's tremendous variation. In fact, uh, just last week in the New York Times, a report uh, was, uh, was quoted that was published in the Journal of Pain that was a large survey of about 14,000 individuals, and it generally showed that for the same clinical condition, women experience more pain than men, which of course could be either politically correct or politically incorrect, depending on whether you're a woman or a man. 
but the bottom line is that there are, there are sex differences, there are enormous differences within each sex, there are differences associated with uh, ethnicity and race, so the answer is yes. The pain, if, if you want to treat pain, this is again sort of a general concept, if you want to treat pain, you have to live with uncertainty. If you want certainty, become an orthopedist. But if you want to work, treat with pain, you live with uncertainty. The uncertainty related to the fact that you're dealing with an inherently subjective phenomenon. You don't know whether or not what the patient says is actually happening. So you have to live with that. You have to live with the reality that without a specific assessment in the patient, you can't make any assumptions based on what you see clinically. So you'll see patients with widely metastatic disease, tumors in many bones, who will have no pain. No pain. One of the teach when I teach my fellows, for example, I show two bone scans. Both of them are full of tumor. And I point out that on the left was a patient I took care of many years ago who had no pain. And on the right were pa was a patient who had pain in only four spots, even though the whole skeleton let up. So if you just, if I gave you this bone scan and I said, does this patient have pain, what do you want to do? And you'd say, oh my God, that patient needs morphine. Well, not if it's a patient on the left who has nothing. So the reality is you live with that, you have to live with the phenomenon that is extraordinarily heterogeneous and you can't make a plan of care without an individual assessment. So, and this, and this uh, last schema speaks to what I've been saying. This, is, um, this schema is, a, an, is an evolution of mine. I first put this together for, for teaching purposes uh, more than 20 years ago. It's been gradually evolving. This is the one I now have tattooed on my abdomen. <laughs> Next to the vibration machine out there, we do have a tattooist. If anybody <laughs> wants to have this added to any spot in the body that isn't already you know, used for something else, that would be what you might want to have on, the, on your belly. And it basically says that pain is a subjective construct best viewed as illness, but the illness component of pain may be uh, uh, understood as a broader construct of disability or suffering. Nociceptive mechanisms, which is disease in the body, uh, producing um, a stimulus, uh, producing sort of a pain stimulus, or neuropathic mechanisms, some dysfunction, disorder in the nervous system, or psychiatric or psychosocial processes, all of these may contribute to pain in variable ways. You can imagine if nociception would mean like, for example, joint destruction and rheumatoid arthritis. You can imagine the great difference in pain depending upon this and this in two patients who have pain related to joint destruction, right? You can have, you can have the same amount of joint destruction and very different processes affecting, uh, affecting neural functioning, affecting psychological functioning, and of course, tremendously different processes psychologically and spiritually that could potentially alter the, the manner in which pain is experienced or contributes to disability. And I call these social support coping and adaptation. So you have to assess pain, understand it in terms of its pathophysiology, its etiology, its syndrome, understand it in terms of its consequences, in terms of its functioning, in terms of the patient's function and quality of life, in terms of the psychiatric uh, and psychological consequences, and then understand that pain may or may not be profoundly contributing to a broader level of disability or suffering. And one way of understanding that, if you have time to talk to the patient, is to evaluate whether or not the patient has resiliency due to social, in part, supported by social factors or his or her, her own ability to cope and adapt. If you understand the patient, an individual person in terms of this sort of scenario, then you're able to do, uh, I think, uh, a plan of care. And so what, I would just summarize this whole process by saying that, that if you, when you meet a patient with chronic pain, the goal of you or some other member of a team you're a part of is to understand this patient uh, by acquiring a history, examination, review of records, looking at laboratory and imaging studies, and then from that, understanding a pain diagnosis, 
consequences of pain in multiple domains and the comorbidities that that patient also has. And then from that, developing a plan of care, which broadly defined might include primary treatment for the etiology of the pain, like radiation to a bone metastasis. It might include primary treatment for the etiology of comorbidities. It might include symptomatic therapies for pain. And it might include symptomatic therapies for consequences and comorbidities. This, by the way, is a little bit different than the simple biomedical model that most physicians learn. And it's, of, and it's, of course, very challenging to think about a primary care practitioner doing this sort of modeling when you only get 8 to 12 minutes with a patient and you really have to be problem-focused. So it's a hard sell. It's a hard sell to get generalists to do pain well. They need to spend a lot of time with patients. They need to do some critical thinking, and they may not be trained to do it. They don't get remuneration for it. So it's a, it's a hard sell. Pain specialists should be doing this, but I will acknowledge to you that um, pain specialists are a very mixed breed, and some of them will do this, and some of them are much more interested in a high volume practice based on a few, number, a few types of interventions like procedures, and they will not do this either. That's why if you have the ability to participate with a team, your contribution can be very profound. You're the person who might be able to talk to the patient and gain more insight in terms of diagnosis and consequences and comorbidities. You're the person who might be able to help make suggestions about referral for treatment for an etiology of a comorbidity, like sending a patient for, to be evaluated for drug treatment for a comorbid psychiatric condition, for example. Many physicians won't think about that. So this is really, this is really how to bring a team of people together to develop a plan of care. To think about our obligations in each of these boxes, and then possibly to think about what goes in each box. So if you do have the ability to bring together a plan of care for pain, you need to have, again, some framework for thinking about this. And I would submit to you that a framework for thinking about um, a, a comprehensive plan for pain might include treatments that are pharmacotherapeutic, like non-opioids, opioids, or adjuvant analgesics, psychological treatments, like psychoeducational approaches, cognitive behavioral therapies, and others, interventional strategies, so-called, including injection therapies, neural blockade, and implant therapies, rehabilitative strategies, including physical and occupational therapy, modalities like heat, cold, vibration, ultrasound, orthotics, and prosthetics, integrative therapies like acupuncture, chiropractic, music therapy, others, and neuromodulatory therapies like transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, transcranial uh, stimulation, and invasive types of neuromodulation like spinal cord stimulation, and lifestyle changes which are right below the flowers where they usually go, <laughs> like weight loss and exercise. So, when I, when I am asked to assess a complex chronic pain patient, um, I usually need a minute after doing a history and examination in order to collect my thoughts. So for many, many years, I've, I, I have my own practice model for that. I have to walk out of the room. So when I'm done, sometimes the patient uh, helps me because they, they want to get dressed in private. People are so strange. But, <laughs> But for whatever the reason, I know for me, after I take a history, do an examination, review some records, I need to walk out of the room and think about the formulation that I mentioned to you before. What are the, how do you describe the pain? How do you understand it in terms of syndrome etiology and pathophysiology? What are the consequences of the pain in multiple domains? What are the comorbidities? And then I, in my head, will actually go through each of these categories. Still, after all these years, and now with age, I actually need a memory aid. But I go through each of these categories and say to myself, what would an idealized multimodality plan of care look like? Now, it may not be possible. Patient may not have insurance. Patient may have no desire. Patient may live at a distance. Patient may not have a specialist who does any of these things in the neighborhood. But at least in my mind, I will have some understanding of an idealized plan of care that I can then talk to the patient about. 
And this is, again, one, I started the, uh, talking to you about the importance of, of you as practitioners having some understanding about what physicians and others who might treat pain at a specialist level or a generalist level have to do. What's in the armamentarium? And this is what's in the armamentarium. Again, I don't do interventions, but I know enough about interventions so I make referrals. I don't do music therapy unless you can call screeching at the moon music therapy. I do a lot of that, but I don't do it otherwise, and I need to make a referral. So I want to um, uh, now take about five minutes or so to do a very, very quick flyby about drugs. And this, again, my goal here is to give you a sense of how far things have come in the past quarter century. Uh, when I first got interested in pain, we had opioids, we had a couple of anti-inflammatory drugs, and we literally used a couple of non-traditional analgesics that were neither opioid nor non-opioid drugs, just a couple, and that was really what we did. Now the list of medicines that might be used for chronic pain is quite long. It's probably about 60, 70 medicines. And it's just good for you, I think, to have a, a broad uh, flyby over that complexity. And I'll mention a few things too, but I'm just going to skip over this quite quickly. If a patient has acute pain that's mild or moderate, a non-opioid is a best practice, but if the pain is severe, then the mainstay approach is an opioid. And other therapies may be considered for some syndromes, like an epidural injection for an acute radiculopathy. But by and large, if a patient has acute severe pain, they need an opioid. Dentists know this. Some doctors do not. Pain due to active cancer or illness, pharmacotherapy is the mainstay, with opioids being the primary drug, the drug class if the patient's pain is moderate or severe. Sometimes interventions are considered. Sometimes rehabilitation therapies are considered. And integrative therapies are usually considered. If the patient has chronic non-cancer pain, I told you my discomfort with that term, but you know how I'm eating it. If someone has chronic non-cancer pain, opioids are not the first-line therapy. Opioids may not be appropriate at all. The decision about opioids needs a separate critical assessment of risk and benefit in every case. But there are a variety of things that are done for chronic pain. The non-opioids and adjuvant analgesics are the mainstay in pharmacotherapeutic drugs with opioids considered for some people as a best practice. Psychological approaches including CBT and psychoeducational strategies. Injection therapies are used very commonly by the pain specialist community. Rehabilitative strategies and integrative therapies, neuromodulation, and lifestyle changes. These are the approaches that if a patient with low back pain in the setting of, se uh, of physical uh, uh, impairment and a mood disorder, that patient comes to a pain specialist. That pain specialist usually, or should, as a best practice, talk about all of these therapies in an idealized way. There has been so much change in the last, uh, last couple of decades in the use of these three drugs. And I think what I'd like to do is just skip past the non-opioids and just show you a few of, the, of, what, of what's been called the adjuvant analgesics. So you all know that anti-inflammatory drugs, the NSAIDs, are widely used for acute and chronic pain. There has been emerging data in the last few years about risk. We now know, for, now know, for example, that all NSAIDs increase the risk of myocardial infarction, angina, TIA, stroke, and symptomatic peripheral vascular disease. All NSAIDs are prothrombotic, all of them. But they vary from drug to drug. Short-term use is generally quite safe. And long-term use clearly has a benefit in patients who have a careful risk-benefit analysis done. But when I was in training, for example, we didn't even appreciate, we, there was no way of appreciating the risk, the prothrombotic risk associated with those drugs. So NSAIDs have been around a long time. Their use is ev evolving with an increased understanding of um, toxicity. 
But this group of drugs, the adjuvant analgesics, has really been extraordinary. As I mentioned before, when I was uh, first getting into this field, we, we literally would only use two or three of these so-called adjuvant analgesics. The term adjuvant was coined because they were usually used along with some other primary analgesic, like an NSAID or an opioid. But since that time, this term has really become a misnomer because these drugs are now used in, independently of any other analgesic, and there are a large number of them. For example, analgesic antidepressants can work for any kind of pain. A large number of topical therapies is now uh, coming on the market, including some that have just appeared in the last year. The so-called alpha-2 adrenergic drugs like clonidine and tizanidine, sometimes the corticosteroids, these are all drugs that can be used for any kind of pain. The antidepressant drugs include the tricyclic drugs like Elevil or Norpramin, or the newer drugs like Cymbalta or Civella. These drugs are primary analgesics. They can work for any kind of pain. Topical drugs include things like the lidocaine patch, other local anesthetic creams and gels, low concentration capsaicin, which you can buy in the pharmacy, and now a new high concentration capsaicin patch, which is on the market for post-herpetic neuralgia. One hour application of this patch will give some patients three months of pain relief. Important, important new advance in treating post-herpetic neuralgia and maybe other things. Topical antidepressants, topical anti-inflammatory drugs, all now available to treat chronic pain. What if the patient has neuropathic pain? The, the appearance on the market more than 10 years ago of gabapentin, Neurontin, changed everything. So now we have gabapentin or Neurontin, pregabalin or Lyrica, uh, other drugs that are anti-epileptic drugs used widely for pain. Also sodium channel blockers like lidocaine or um, some of the oral drugs that are like lidocaine. Other drugs including cannabinoids. We now have two cannabinoids on the U.S. market and a third cannabinoid as of last week just got permission for a national developmental project. So we expect a third cannabinoid if the study is positive, to be on the market within the next two years or so. So these are all drugs now that are used for neuropathic pain, all evidence-based treatments for neuropathic pain. So many drugs here. How, how could this be of use to you? Well, if you have a patient, for example, with severe diabetic painful polyneuropathy or severe post neuralgia or any other kind of neuropathic pain, and in talking to the patient, you find out that they had Neurontin and nothing else, then you might wonder whether or not this person had best practice in terms of pharmacotherapy. I would think it'd be very unlikely that a person with refractory, severe neuropathic pain who's been given one medicine during years of pain has been what I would term best practice pharmacotherapy, let alone all the other stuff. These are things that you might be able to now pick up and bring back to a treatment team, saying, you know, there are many other drugs to be tried. Maybe we can refer this patient to someone who knows this pharmacotherapy. So what I try to do today was, first of all, suggest to you that chronic pain is a, is a huge problem for individuals and families, but it's also a big public health problem with a scope that includes 100 million people or more and a cost of $500 billion a year or more. Really dramatic higher costs than cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined. And I try to suggest to you that every patient with chronic pain needs to be separately assessed because, and it's a tough thing to do, but pain is inherently subjective. Pain as a symptom can also be pain as illness. And most people who have chronic pain have some element of pain as illness, meaning to say pain associated with consequences on their function, on their mood, on their family. To assess pain, you need to have the biomedical piece assessed for sure, but you also need to have that broader assessment. You need to understand the pain diagnosis, but also understand the consequences and comorbidities because the plan of care for chronic pain should include primary therapy for the pain etiology and for comorbidities, and then symptomatic therapy 
for the pain and comorbidities. You guys can be critical uh, colleagues, collaborators in developing a symptomatic plan of care for the pain and its, co its consequences and comorbidities. And then when you think about what others of the treatment team may do, look at the example of pharmacotherapy and recognize that the past 20 years has really brought this explosion of new medicines and new understandings of risk and benefit. And you could look at what the patient has gotten. You can ask the patient what he or she has been told or understand. And hopefully you'll have some sense, was this reflective of best practice or not? And if it wasn't reflective of best practice, then what's your professional obligation to bring that back to others of the treatment team and just say, I wonder whether we have other strategies we could think about here. And if everybody in the treatment team took that obligation on in a way that reflected professionalism and collegiality, then you'd have more patients getting greater access to best practices in pain medicine. Thanks for your attention. I'm looking to Joanne to see if I should take a question or not. Uh, there's any burning questions. We have one minute. We have one minute for a burning question. Yes. How often do you run into uh, cases of RND? RSD. RSD? Yeah, all the time. But we're a, tr we're a treatment center. So it's very common for you. Common for us, yeah. What is RSD? Re it's reflex sympathetic dystrophy. The new term is complex regional pain syndrome, and it's a specific type of neuropathic pain that's associated with changes in the skin and can be very, very difficult to treat. Yes? My question, as a social worker, and you kind of touched on this, I just wonder where it fit into your cosmology here. Um, when you talk about the pain syndrome, do you mean pain syndrome in the Line. The other is people not being able to articulate really what, what's happening right. know, based on education or just it's, it's very... Subjective. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So the question was, um, uh, what, are, what are the challenges when patients can't articulate their pain or their pain history? And of course, there's a huge literature on how to assess pain in nonverbal patients, how to assess pain in preverbal patients, and I think you'll hear more about that today in terms of the NICU project? And the answer is that there's no easy answer, but, but well, it is possible. Is, hmm? is that considered a sort of psychosocial? No, no, I mean, I think, I think pain is the entry point. So if, you, if a person can't articulate it, and it's a, it's a sentient adult, it may be due to psychological factors, may not be. The reality is, can you understand that patient's experience just in terms of the symptom distress first? and then try to understand the factors that may be contributing to it. I would never jump, make, make the leap that you just made without evidence. You know, in other words, the patient can't articulate it. Does that mean that the pain is more likely or less likely to be complicated by psychological factors? Maybe yes, maybe no. First try to figure out what they're experiencing, then figure out the etiology, pathophysiology. I think that was it, they burned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.